we're going to do some logistic map fixed point analysis, but we want to be able to calculate uh, maybe the first few of these period doubling bifurcation points. So the first period doubling is at three, and then we could look at others. So we're going to try to derive the first few Rn. Those are the parameter values where we get period doubling. And so what is our map? Remember the logistic map. It's Xn plus one equals R Xn one minus Xn. We could rewrite this to look for what fixed points are. The fixed points X star are those that satisfy that X star equals R X star one minus X star. So zero always satisfies that. Is there a time when it's not zero? So we could divide both sides by X star. So assuming that it's non-zero equal to R one minus X star. And so we do get something, one minus one over R, only for R greater than one. So for R less than one, then all we have is just zero. And what about the stability? We actually already looked at how you formulate the stability. We did this in a previous lecture. So if we study the local stability, we let X N equal X star plus eta N where we're assuming that this eta and this is just a small displacement away from the fixed point. So something small, x n plus one is going to equal x star plus eta n plus one, right? If we're near a fixed point, then it just means that displacement is going to grow or shrink. That's what we want to find out. So we'll say, we want to know the mapping. What is eta n plus one as a function of eta n? So then we go to, you know, what is this? In this case, right, this right-hand side, we could write as F X N. So this is F X N. So it's F X star plus eta N. Do a Taylor series expansion. We get F X star plus eta N the derivative or the slope of the curve, the map at that fixed point and then higher order terms. But right, this, because this is a fixed point, these will cancel out. So we're left with eta n plus one equals f prime x star eta n. This would be the um, multiplier. So X star is stable if the magnitude, all we need is the magnitude is less than one, right? So if it's negative 0.9, that means you have around that fixed point, every time it's shrinking by a factor of 0.9 and sort of jumping back and forth. So that's all that matters. And just like with one dimensional ODEs, all we have is stable and unstable and maybe critical points if this magnitude, if this modulus exactly equals one, but really the only types are stable and unstable. We're talking about 1D maps. So if that slope is greater than one, then it's unstable because things are moving away. It's locally unstable. Let's analyze what we have for the fixed point. So for the fixed point zero, and later we'll look at this one. What about for zero? And we will eventually get to deriving the RNs. So near X star equals zero, near that fixed point. We just have to look at what F prime is. Well, we could calculate that. For any X, actually F prime of any X, how have we defined F up there? So this is R minus two R, x. So f prime at zero, the slope of the curve at zero is r. So that means that the origin is stable for uh, r less than one. r has to be positive. In fact, in general, we're only allowing it to go between zero and four. So that point's stable for r less than one, but then you know, according to this criteria, it, it goes unstable at r greater than one. And that new point, 
x star equals one minus one over r. It's born at r equals one. And we could figure out its stability. So f prime of this new point, the fixed point that's not zero, this is going to be based on that formula, it's r minus two r and just plug in x star one minus one over r. So what is this? This is two minus r. So that new point, if you look at the magnitude, that's the magnitude of two minus r. So it's stable for r greater than one, less than three. So if we were to sketch what we have here in terms of the fixed point, so this is the kind of the first part of that bifurcation diagram. We've got a stable point at zero until we get hit the value one. And then there's a branch that goes like one minus one over R and that's stable. Whereas the origin becomes unstable. So we're going to make that dashed in terms of the one dimensional bifurcations that we talked about early in the course, what type of bifurcation does this look like? Anyone remember? Maybe we've got something that's like that. And then like this, if it was, so if it had this, remember what we called that transcritical. So we actually, we have a, what looks like a map version of a transcritical bifurcation. If you were to zoom in on that, it looks kind of like what the laser did at some particular value of uh, parameter, the N equals zero population of the laser went unstable. And then you had something, something else. So we have a, it's a map version of a transcritical bifurcation. There are map versions of all of the bifurcations that we talked about for 1D ODEs. There are analogs for maps and then some. So there's new things that maps can do. All right, so we've got this. Uh, this goes all the way up to three and then you know something, something new happens. This point seems to go unstable. Maybe we have a new transcritical bifurcation. I don't know. I don't know. So let's look at R equals three. F prime of that fixed point equals two minus R. If R is three, then this equals exactly negative one. Hmm. Okay. Maybe there's something to that. Let me sketch what the plot looks like. This is Xn and then Xn plus one with the 45 degree line. And then we've got our map. So this is our fixed point, right? Right there. X star. So F prime of, at X star, I was trying really hard to make it a slope of negative one. So this is a slope of negative one. And let's zoom in on what's happening right there. So if we you know, looked at that and blew it up, what do we have? Here's the 45 degree line and then a slope of negative 45 degrees. So just in terms of the, the cobweb diagram, this is an approximation of what the actual map looks like there. If we have an initial point, let's say that's not exactly at the fixed point, it's here, then according to the cobweb diagram, we would go to the nearest point. But then that would lead us, right? We go back to the 45 degree line, and but then we're going to this negative 45 degree line, and it's actually making a cycle. We're going between these two points. So here is X star, and we're going between two other points. Let's call them maybe P and Q. So it seems like there's something important about the slope or the multiplier going to negative one, right? So this was the diagonal slope equal to one. And then this is the curve of the map with the slope negative one. With the parameter value right next to that, it looks like period two behavior can happen. So at R equals three, we have the slope or multiplier goes to negative one. And that's the condition that gives rise to period doubling. So if we were to sneak up up here at three, we would have two new points showing up. And we could even analytically uh, solve for what the points P and Q are. But if you look at that bifurcation, it looks like a pitchfork. It looks like a pitchfork bifurcation. So here we had a transcritical here we have what looks like a map version of a pitchfork bifurcation. And it is. It's not called pitchfork typically. It's just called the period doubling bifurcation. But it would be the analog. We can find these points. Let's call them P and Q. P 
and Q. They aren't fixed points of the map. They're period two points of the map. P and Q are period two points of F. F of P equals Q and F of Q equals P. You plug them in, you'll get that F of F of P equals P. So a period two point of F is a fixed point of F2, two applications of the map. How, so how would we solve? We could just write F of F of P and write it out R F P one minus F P and then expand that out R R P one minus P times one minus R P one minus P and notice what this is. If we're setting this equal to P, you get rewrite it as something equals zero, and we have a fourth degree polynomial, which we can analytically solve once we get to a much higher. Yeah. It's looking dicey. How would we sketch what this is graphically? I'll just plot the diagram again of xn, xn plus one from zero to one. We've got our 45 degree line. And now we're gonna be plotting F2. F2 is going to look like, so two applications of F, it will, looks something like that, right, zero and one, zero, one. If you wanna see it, we could even plot it with that uh, computational tool. R, I slightly increase it. You can kind of see right around three that that slope goes to negative one. And as we've passed that, okay, here is showing two applications of the map. It's a bit hard to see. I guess we could plot the attractor for some orbits, you see what it's doing. What about slightly below? Yeah, you don't see anything, but then it goes through that cycle. So that's the attractor. The attractor is only going through two of the four roots of the polynomial. The fixed point that went unstable is still there kind of between these two, and then the origin is unstable. So let's leave that for now. These are the four roots. There is P, Q, and then the, the fixed point of the map is also the fixed point under two iterates of the map. It's just unstable. And we can find P and Q explicitly from that fourth degree polynomial. I won't do it here, but you could. What's the next bifurcation? The next bifurcation would be when at one of these, you know, pick either point, where does the slope, where does let's say F2 prime of P or Q, that's right, you know, Q doesn't really matter. When does that equal negative one? So this would be the condition for the next period doubling. You can find it. It turns out that happens at R2. So the value of R equal to one plus square root of six. And that is 3.449. And so on. You could start looking for, you know, R3. We're getting to the limits of what we can analytically solve for. So it ends up coming computationally. Let's take a look at this. R is 3.2. Uh, what were we looking for? 3.4. Oh, so we went above it. So we're above 3.44. This is at 3.49. And you notice period doubling happened. But we must be below R3. We could. Try to really gently nudge this, see where period doubling happens again. So this, this looks like a period eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. yeah. So some period doubling happened again. So if we were to sketch the bifurcation diagram or orbit diagram, what would it look like? We have something stable up till one. Right? This is the R axis. And then we had a branch coming off. And then at three, that branch went unstable, but two others were born. And then at one plus square root of six, which is about 3.44, another doubling happened. We actually still have an unstable period two point, but out of that, we get a stable period four and so on. So this tree 
diagram just keeps growing and growing. I think you can analytically get R3. I'm not going to. So you could get them. We'll say more about it when we talk about universal properties of the map. But I, I did want to say something about the period three window that shows up. We talked about that at the end. The period three window is due to that tangent bifurcation. So let me maybe say period three. And this is also related to something called the intermittency route to chaos. Up here, this is the period doubling route to chaos. So there are some mechanisms that have been identified by mathematical physicists about routes to chaos in maps, but they're not just limited to maps. You could see these in systems that are modeled with differential equations. You could see them experimentally, but what about this period three window? So the period three window for the logistic map, this was, if you remember last time, so let me get rid of the attractor in orbit. We look at the third iterate of F. So I'm just plotting the third iterate. And this is when you see that there's these, what look locally like parabolas. There's, there's three that are about to hit the 45 degree line. And then they do like right around this point actually. But what happens right before that? If I were to look at iterates of the map, you'll notice something interesting. We get what looks like bottleneck behavior. So if I start, I don't wanna start here. I wanna start like there maybe, or there, I don't know. I wanna show it. Whoa, it's actually hard to see. <laughs> But things get stuck really close to those tangency points. They're bottlenecks. It's just like the ghosts. They're ghosts of the period three points. They're ghosts of fixed points of the third iterate of the map. What do I mean? Let me show a figure. Okay, so this is showing the map right before that tangency. And by tangency, I mean that these parts that are locally looking like parabolas, are about to intersect the 45 degree line. What's going to happen? What you'll see is that some initial condition, say here, will go here and then go here, and then it'll just kind of get stuck going through there. So you have a bottleneck region. So this is showing what I'm talking about, right? In this region, if you think of going from after the bifurcation to before the bifurcation, where we have a saddle node, the map version of a saddle node happening. Before that, we have the map version of a ghost. So map version of ghost, or this is, you call this a region of high residence time because it takes a large number of iterates, not a large number of continuous time, but a large number of discrete time units to get through it. We, in fact, in this case, so we've got three bottlenecks. And this phenomenon is known as intermittency because you'll spend time in sort of a large region of phase space, and then you'll sort of get stuck going through a bottleneck. So if we were to plot what this looks like as a time series, so this is for an R value that's just before this tangency, R of 3.8. So we've got something that's nearly period three. This is if you look at all the iterates, we're not looking at just the map of F3, just all of them. You've got something that's nearly period three, then you'll have something that looks like chaos and then nearly period three. So this is, this phenomenon is intermittency and it's related to the intermittency route to chaos. And it's seen not just in maps, you can see it in actual systems. So it's been seen in lasers experimentally. And we're changing the, the condition of the laser here as things go upward but then showing it a time series. So we're changing a parameter. And you'll notice, you know, there's these times where it's, it's kind of stuck and then does something chaotic stuck. And as you increase this further, well, then you could have what looks like full-blown chaos happening. So that's seen experimentally. It's the intermittency route to chaos. I've seen it also in mechanical systems of multiple degrees of freedom. There is this schematic that was in a book by Marshall it could be a large dimensional phase space. And that's what's being sketched up here, where you've got something that wanders around in a large dimensional phase space. And then it'll spend time, this doesn't quite show, you know, going through a bottleneck. And maybe it spends some time in that bottleneck, or maybe it doesn't. And then it's spending a lot of time in that another large region till it 
happens to go through a bottleneck again. And so you'll see something that, that looks like this and it's, it's chaotic. So this is seen in uh, high dimensional mechanical systems and maybe other systems that don't come from mechanics, but that's where I've seen it. This is a slide from one of my talks about dynamics of comets in the solar system. So even comets will do this. The bottlenecks there are related to fixed points in the field of the sun and Jupiter. So we have that. Um, all right.